Hello, Green Nines, and welcome to your Q&A video for March 30th. So what this is, is it is answers to the questions you asked on that Google check-in form from last week. So what I'll do is I'll go through some of the questions that appeared. I'll talk about it, try to clarify things. And then, yeah, hopefully you get some use out of it. Now, I don't have every single question here simply because some themes appeared more than once. Yes, so I have one kind of version or, or one thing from it on here, um, but hopefully through this, all the questions that you introduced through the form are answered. So first thing that we have here is the different parts of an atom and atomic theory. So let me give you kind of a little quick mini lesson about the atom and atomic theory. So to start off, for the atom, what we have is a nucleus, and inside of the nucleus, we have both protons and neutrons. Let me just kind of draw to here and say neutrons, which is shown with an N0, and then protons, which is shown with a P and a positive. The reason why for the P and the positive is proton P, yeah, and then protons have a positive charge. Neutrons have a neutral charge, so that's why there's a zero there. Now, around the nucleus, we have electrons that exist in energy levels, so this is the Bohr model of the atom. So if I draw a circle here, and let's see if I can do it successfully, uh, it's rough, but oh well. I have electrons that are within energy levels of uh, the atom. So let's actually do an example Bohr diagram and see if that helps. So let's say that I was going to talk about something like lithium. Okay, so if I were to draw a Bohr diagram for lithium, I would first take a look at the atomic number for lithium, and the atomic number is 3. So that is equal to the number of protons for lithium. It's also equal to the number of electrons because an atom will have an even number of protons and electrons. Now, the mass number for lithium is 6.94, which we would round to the nearest whole number of 7. So you always take the, the atomic mass on your periodic table and round it to the nearest whole number. This is equal to both protons and neutrons added together. So given that we already know that the protons is 3, then that must mean that I have 4 neutrons. So if I were to draw the Bohr diagram for this, I would start out by drawing my circle for my nucleus. I have three protons and four neutrons within my nucleus. In my first energy level, my ring, I would have two electrons. So I can draw this as either dots or E minus. So I'm gonna do the E minus here. There's my two electrons. Don't know why that happens. Let's try that again. Okay, E minus, and then uh, second energy level can hold up to eight, but I only have one electron left. Yeah, so I'll put that right there. So I have two electrons, which is the max for my first energy level. I have one left over, which, is go, which goes into the second energy level. That can hold a max of eight, and the third can hold eight as well. So that's the um, Bohr model for lithium. Hopefully that helps. For atomic theory, the whole reason for the atomic theory lesson is for you to understand the idea of the scientific method, the beauty of it. So with atomic theory, we learn about all these people and their models of the atom. And then as new technology or scientific evidence came to light, right, the model was revised or changed. So that shows how in science, when new evidence is found, then the theories end up changing in order to accommodate that new evidence. Science is always looking to be disproven, right? And actually we want answers that show us that what we believe is wrong, because then we can revise and change our theories. So the main players that you should know about in atomic theory is you should know about Dalton, right? Bolton Dalton. So he is responsible for the billiard ball of the model of the atom, which is essentially that atoms are uh, balls, right, that each atom, each element has a different ball. We combine them in fixed proportions in order to make compounds. They can't be created or destroyed or split apart into smaller parts, all that jazz. After that, we had Thompson, okay, Thompson and his plum pudding model. So this is with the cathode ray tube showing that electrons were a thing, these negative particles. Then he said, okay, well, we must have these negative electrons within a positive particle soup. So that's plums, the negative electrons within the positive particle pudding, right? So that was his model, was the plum pudding model. Rutherford was a big jump up from that. Uh, Rutherford did the gold foil experiment and discovered that atoms have uh, a nucle nucleus that is very dense and positively charged. 
and that electrons are then going around the nucleus. He also um, made a theory that there were neutrons, these neutral subatomic particles within the atom as well. So nucleus, positive, dense, with protons and neutrons inside of it, and then electrons are rotating around it. The difference between Rutherford and Bohr is that Bohr said the electrons exist in these distinct energy levels, right? So they're not just willy-nilly around the nucleus, but instead they are in these distinct energy levels, the first canal two, the second eight, the third eight, and so on. Now, Rutherford, this is called the planetary model. Okay, planetary model, and that's because like electrons are moving around, right? Like moons around the planet or like planets move around stuff. While Bohr is the solar system model, which is saying that these electrons are in distinct orbits around the nucleus, just like uh, uh, planets are in distinct orbits around the sun. So that's the solar system model. So you should know these guys, okay? You should uh, know their names and then the name of the model and then the key points of what they're responsible for in the theory. So take a look at your notes. If you're confused about that, give it another read. All right, next, the periodic table. Um, not sure where the confusion is. I would like to just talk about the main parts that we care about for the periodic table. Okay, the main things that you should know, and then hopefully that answers your, answers your question. So first of all, uh, there's the staircase line. That's the most important part for us to kind of learn about in Science 9. To the left of the staircase line, I have my metals, with the exception of hydrogen, right? Which is a non-metal on the left-hand side. And then on the right, I have, oh, there it is again. That's fun how that happens. Down the right, I have my non-metals. And then on either side of the staircase line, straddling that, straddling that line, I have the metalloids, which have both properties of metals and non-metals. Now, if it is to the right, it's still considered a non-metal as we continue our discussion. But in terms of properties, it's a bit of a mix. It's kind of a hybrid. It has a little bit of both. Okay, uh, and then you should know about some of the groups. You should know that you have group one right here, which is the alkali metals, the most reactive metals, and you have the alkali earth metals in group two. Okay, uh, hydrogen is not a part of the alkali metals, even though it is in group one. And then on the non-metal side, you have halogens, which is group 17, which is the most reactive non-metals. And then you have noble gases, which is group 18, which is completely inert. It doesn't react, it's very non-reactive. So hopefully that clears up. Main thing is that metals are on the left and non-metals are on the right. Okay, this is more about the course. The lessons are just a little undescriptive and hard to follow. I, I apologize if that's the case. I'm not sure if this is referring to the video lessons or my directions each day. Uh, I will certainly try to be more descriptive and make it easier to follow. In the videos, new ones I record, I'll make sure that I'll do kind of summaries and be very succinct in the language I used, if I'm being honest. I'm now recording this one right now for the second time, uh, just because I wasn't happy with how much I rambled on around a few answers, and hopefully this time is better. But you'll never see the first time, so you can't compare. Anyways, uh, I apologize if that's the case. I, I am actually giving it my best go throughout all of this. I just have uh, several courses that I'm preparing for, uh, Chemistry 30 being the really, really big one. And it takes a lot of time to make these videos and to prepare all the content. And it's a big adjustment as well for teachers trying to completely shift how they teach, um, dealing with all digital resources, trying to work things around that. It's been tough. So I apologize, but I will try my hardest to be more descriptive and make things easier to follow in the future as much as I can. If you have some specific recommendations that I can uh, do, I certainly will look at that and consider them as well. Okay, uh, please specifically clarify what we do and do not note down. Uh, so <clears throat> the honest answer is it's up to you. I'm providing you with submarine notes for each lesson, either as a scan or a Google Doc. They might not match the video perfectly, but they're notes you can look at for learning as another resource besides the video. When you're actually watching the video, you can write whatever you want or not down. It doesn't matter to me. It's whatever happens or helps for your learning. So if it helps you to write some things down while you're watching the video, you should definitely do that. Okay, if it's better for you to just really focus in on the video for your learning, then you should do that. When there are examples, it will say try this now or something like that and then a pause. You should definitely pause the video during that time and try things out 
right? Write that down, your attempts at a question, and then take a look afterwards. But in terms of notes, it's not the same as a normal class was of where you write down what I write down on the whiteboard. Instead, you have notes provided to you, so you don't have to write them down anymore. However, if writing down notes, if going through that process helps you to learn, I think you should do it, okay? Um, but the focus now is what helps you learn the best instead of me telling you or directing you, hey, write this down and write this down. It is what helps you learn, and that's what you should be doing. This next thing is quite related to that of how will assessment look. So the main thing that I'll be looking at in terms of informing a grade for you uh, will be the assignments that you hand in, either scanned, right, or as a Google Doc to an assignment in Classroom. So right now, you have that Atomic Structures assignment. So I'll be taking a look at that, I'll be giving it a mark, and then I'll be handing it back to you. But that is something that you will, uh, that I will be checking to see where your understanding lies. Okay, but things aren't the same in that it's really difficult for me to give you tests and quizzes and be sure that it's done in a secure way, right? I can't watch you take a test or a quiz. So assessment is really changing. So it will be more around the assignment end of things and me seeing your process and doing stuff rather than it actually being these big exams and quizzes where I get the majority of my marks from. So uh, at the end of the day, just be patient. Keep on, keep on trying, plugging away at things. Any questions, please let me know. But yeah, those are, those are the questions and answers from the last check-in. That shows you what I do at the check-ins. So um, as we go into the end of next week, please, please write down things that you're confused about. Be specific, and I'll be happy to answer them in this format. All right, have a good rest of your day.